Welcome to worship with Bridgewater Church of the Brethren on this last Sunday of October. I'm Christy Dowdy, the Senior Interim Pastor, and I'm worshiping with you from my own home during this COVID season. It is great to have each of you join us wherever you are on this last Sunday of the month. Bridgewater Church of the Brethren is an inclusive family of faith seeking to follow Jesus and live the love of God. If you'd like to learn more about our congregation, you can visit our website at bwcob.org. During our virtual worship, we do not have a specific time set aside for receiving tithes and offerings, but we are very grateful for every one of you who have contributed to the church's ministry, especially during this time of the pandemic. You may mail in your gifts, or certainly there is an option to give online. Also, during this month, we have had estimate of giving cards, your commitment for the new year, sent out. And if you have not yet returned your card, it's not too late. We would be happy to receive them, along with those 104 which have already been returned. Thank you very much for doing that. Next Sunday is our church council meeting being held in a hybrid form at 1 p.m. We hope that many of you who are a part of this congregation will feel free to join us either in person with proper social distancing or you can join with Zoom. A connection and all the information will be sent on our e-connections during this next week. If you'd like further information, don't hesitate to call one of the pastors or our church office. The printed newsletter will also be in your newsletter in the coming week with much more information about the many happenings that are going on at Bridgewater Church of the Brethren these days. We hope that you will sense God in our midst, connecting us virtually as we come to worship this day, as we pour out our prayers, particularly for Nigeria in these days, and pray for all of our brothers and sisters there, and I especially remember Sharon Flotten, who is a member of our congregation and working there in the theological school. Again, welcome to worship. We're glad you're here. We worship in the name of Jesus. Together, the children of a loving God. We are neighbors and friends, sisters and brothers. Together, the family of God. We are not the same. We don't always agree. But together, we look towards our God. Setting aside what divides us and embracing what unites us. Joining together in praise to God. May the peace and love of Christ be upon us. As together we seek to follow Jesus and live the love of God.
Will you pray with me? Look upon us, O Lord, and let all the darkness of our souls vanish before the beams of your brightness. Fill us with holy love and open to us the treasures of your wisdom. All our desire is known unto you. Therefore, perfect what you have begun and what your spirit has awakened us to ask in prayer. We seek your face, so turn your face unto us and show us your glory. Then shall our longing be satisfied and our peace shall be perfect. Amen. Hi, everyone. I'm happy to be in front of you again today. I wonder, what's going on in your life? As always, I wish you could tell me what's going on in my life. Um, you know what? Some people were really nice to me this week. I've been struggling as a teacher on how to get books into kids' hands because, you know, we're, we're still learning on the computer and I want, but I still want them to have good books to read. And, um, a friend of mine sponsored our class and bought books for our kids so that I'm going to be able to hand them a book here and when they get here in a week or two. And we're going to be able to read a good quality book instead of relying on a bunch of internet resources that just aren't as good as, as, as a good quality book. So that was, that was really nice. Um, I got to see some friends. We had to, of course, sit socially distanced as the term is, but it was great to see them. And it's really nice to, to be able to connect, even though things are so crazy and different and sometimes a little scary. So I wanted to read to you today a story. Um, it's from the Children of God Storybook Bible by um, Desmond Tutu. This is the um, the Law of Love. Um, it's going to go along with the scripture that will be read this this morning. Sometimes it seems that there are so many rules. It's often hard to know which ones are most important. In Jesus's time, people argued about which rule was most important to God. One of the elders, bent over with age and wisdom, heard Jesus teaching his followers. The elder thought to himself, Wow, this guy really knows what he's talking about. The elder leaned on his cane and scratched his white hair. You seem very wise. Tell me, what is the most important rule of all? There are two, Jesus replied. The first is to love God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. The second is to love everyone as much as you love yourself. The elder nodded. You are right, he said. The greatest gift we can offer God is to love him and love his children. And there's the picture from that. So as I've been thinking a lot about this this week. Um, love God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. That makes sense. We, we know that that's our job. But the second one Love everyone as much as you love yourself. I think that a lot of people are having a hard time with that right now, and I'm not. And, and I actually, I, I wonder if I know, if now I know why. <clears throat> We're supposed to love everyone as much as we love ourselves, but there's a lot of hate and there's a lot of anger going on in the world. And I think it might be because we actually don't love ourselves enough. Um, if we if we loved ourselves more that we might see that, oh, you know what? I'm actually not being very nice to this person who thinks differently than me. Or I'm not being nice to that person who made a mistake and it affected me. Um, I think if we learn to love ourselves a little bit more, it might be easier to love our neighbors that mu the, the way we're supposed to. So that got me thinking further. How do we show love? How can we, how can we, we say that I love you? So I, was, I want you to think of ways that Either you show someone that you love them or someone shows that they love you. And I was thinking about examples in my life. One uh, might be um, you call up some church friends and say, I'm struggling with this. How can you help? And they say, yeah, come over here. I'm going to get you in touch with my son. And he, we've got some books for you. And I'm going to help make your classroom a great place to learn. Um, it could be that you... Remember, you know, a friend, um, I've been, I've been having some hard times recently. Um, you guys know that, uh, Bryce and Avery's daddy, Jeremy was one of my best friends and he, he passed away this summer 
and I've been sad a lot, and that's okay to be sad when your when your friend dies. But I was, you know, why am I so sad about this still? And I, you know, I said, you know what? Jeremy wasn't great with feelings, but Jeremy did a good job of checking in with me. He he would call me up and be like, hey, what's going on? Or hey, let's get dinner. And then eventually we'd talk about what's going on in our lives, and I always felt better after I saw him. It wasn't that he would he was real deep about what's bothering you, Josh, but he was really good at at connecting with me and making sure I'm okay and, and just knowing what's going on in my life. And so I've been missing that. But that was a way that he showed me love, and I need to do, do better about showing my friends love that way. Um, I was thinking about how does Aaron, how, my wife Aaron, how does she show me love? And I, you know the best way that she shows me love? I love good jokes and bad jokes and everything in between. And Aaron shows me love by letting me tell her those jokes and not just like completely groaning every time she, sometimes she does, she has to, because they're really bad. But other times she might even laugh and she shows me love by not saying, Josh, don't ever tell me those bad jokes again. Um, I've sh I showed my family love. Um, I'm not much of an animal person, but everybody else in the house wanted wanted a pet. And I said, you know what? I love you all so much. I'm going to not, not allow. We all do think we make decisions together kind of in our house, but I'm going to, I'm going to say it's okay. Even though I'm not really a big animal person. And, and I, I showed them love cause I saw that they needed this in their life. And so we now have two kitties that everybody loves. I even love them. So of course I learned from that too. But I, I know there are a lot of ways that you can show love in your life. And I think it's important in this time, in times of stress or when you don't know um, what's going on, that it's important to still try to show those those ways that we love each other. So it's I can show love by is is the is how I've been thinking about things recently. So I would love for you to let me know somehow. Um, send me a note, send me an email, draw me a picture, but it would be I can show love by, and then it would be what did you do? What is something it very little or something very big? that you did that you could show someone love because as we learned from our story, that's the most important rule of all. Will you pray with me before we go? Dear God, help us to follow your most important rule to love. Amen. See you soon. I hope.
Our scripture reading today comes to us from Matthew's Gospel, chapter 22, verses 34 through 46. When the Pharisees heard that he had silenced the Sadducees, they gathered together, and one of them, a lawyer, asked him a question to test him. Teacher, which commandment in the law is the greatest? He said to him, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the greatest and first commandment. And second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments hang all the law and all the prophets. Now, while the Pharisees were gathered together, Jesus asked them this question. What do you think of the Messiah? Whose son is he? They said to him, the son of David. And he said to them, how is it then that David by the spirit calls him Lord, saying, the Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I put your enemies under your feet. If David thus calls him Lord, how can he be his son? No one was able to give him an answer, nor from that day did anyone dare to ask him any more questions. I am not a very socially graceful person, and it's not uncommon for me to spout my opinion in an overly blunt fashion before thinking through its impact on those around me. It has been one of my less than positive traits ever since childhood. I cringe every time that I remember a recording that my mother made of my siblings and me back in the old days when no cell phones existed and when recording things on tape cassettes was new and exciting. My siblings and I were very young, kindergarten age more or less. My mother asked each of us a series of fun questions. One of the questions was, what is something that smells good? My younger sister answered, daisies, with pride in her voice. Then you can hear my voice interrupting, no they don't, daisies stink. When I saw her joy turn to hurt, I felt really bad. Unfortunately, I have accumulated more such moments over my lifetime, though hopefully with less frequency, but it is a personal trait that I need to be conscious of, lest it pop up like a thorny weed to prick an unsuspecting conversation partner. One such moment occurred many years ago. I was then a fully grown adult with no excuse of tender childhood to fall back on. I was making small talk with a colleague when, for some reason, I began to talk about tattoos and how I didn't understand why anyone would get one and what I thought were the negative aspects about them. Then I remember that she looked at me and said, my mother has a tattoo. And there was that familiar look of hurt that I had seen before. Her look of hurt and surprise stayed with me. And I began to think more about why I even brought up the subject and what did I really think about tattoos? And why did I think what I did? It was still a time when tattoos were less common and kept covered and out of sight in my community. It was not a topic that really came up within our household growing up. I can't remember my parents ever saying anything directly about tattoos. Where did I form my opinions about them? And why did I care enough about it to express my opinions about them? Thinking it over, it seemed to be due to how I had heard views expressed about them in society in general, and how people with tattoos were depicted and treated in movies and on TV. At that time, people with tattoos seemed to be depicted in two categories, servicemen or people from, quote, an undesirable walk of life, unquote. I really had no personal experience that I was aware of on which to base my opinion. Of course, I had probably met many people with tattoos, but I just didn't realize it. Then I began to explore more about the topic, not just tattoos themselves, but even more so about how I formed my opinions about them and why. If I had grown up in a different culture, 
in a Polynesian culture, for example, I would have had a very different view of tattoos, their meaning, and the people who had them. But I was blinded by my filters of my own culture and my very limited personal experiences. I hadn't done the work to really see outside my own perceptions and experiences. I hadn't been sufficiently open, curious, or courageous enough to really explore more. I had just accepted what seemed to permeate the culture around me, and I reflected that back in my opinion without a real basis to do so. Our society and cultural environment has changed greatly since that time. Now, it is very common for people to have tattoos, and I know many, many different people who have chosen to have one, including close friends and family members. The reasons people choose to get a tattoo and what that tattoo represents for each individual are as varied as people are themselves. They may represent a lost loved one or a profound experience. They may commemorate an important milestone, such as surviving cancer, or they may express solidarity among friends or a specific group. They may symbolize one's beliefs or a motivating ideal. They may be just decorative, they may represent a person's self-loathing and be used as a form of self-defacement. They may be meant to intimidate. They may not always be voluntary. They may be a form of reaching out, or they may just make the person feel good. They may be the result of an impulsive moment and regretted, or they may be the result of a very carefully deliberated choice. They may be meant to show one's place in society or indicate a personal strength or characteristic. How easily and effortlessly we can fall into judgmental and discriminatory patterns, even unintentionally. Yet what a deliberate and intentional process is required to work our way out of them. We had gone through different stages of thinking about tattoos. First, from tattoos not really existing in my life, not really being a part of my consciousness. Then later, to them being something I felt I should comment on if I saw one. And then, after my hurtful commentary and reflecting back on that moment, to exploring more about what a tattoo really means and represents for different people. But shouldn't I really be looking past the tattoo and even past its meaning? Shouldn't I be more open to seeing the person themselves and working to better understand the individual from their own experiences and their own perspectives? Shouldn't I work to become more aware of how my own personal experiences and cultural biases may be creating blind spots and distortions in my way of viewing others and thus how I act towards others? I don't think that working to understand the experiences and perspective of others and recognizing my own personal biases means accepting everything and anything. I don't think that it means not holding to important personal beliefs and convictions, but I do think that I, as an adult, am responsible for what I choose to believe and how my beliefs guide my actions. I should have the courage to scrutinize what I believe and why, and I should strive to hold convictions that hold up to close scrutiny and evaluation and that really merit my belief in them. If I have not done that work, or if I'm too afraid to do that work, or if I am unwilling to do that work, then what are my beliefs and convictions really worth, I wonder. If I am human, and if as a human I recognize that I have imperfections and that I am fallible, doesn't it make sense to regularly revisit and re-evaluate that which is most important to me as I strive to follow the best path in the best way that I know how? Doesn't it make sense for me to continually work to hold to worthy beliefs and strive to reach my full potential toward living up to them even if I have failed to do so in the past, or recognize that I may never do so perfectly? It seems our country 
is going through similar, very difficult growing pains as we struggle ever closer toward reaching our full potential and toward living up to what we have said that we believe in as a country, but have fallen far short of. That greater societal struggle seems to be a self-reflection of the internal struggles that we are experiencing within our local communities, be they secular or religious. Do we really believe in what we say we believe in? What do we believe in, really? We are, in some ways, very lucky to be in a time of great struggle and discernment. That means we are growing and striving, and not just accepting the status quo as good enough, when we know that there are great injustices, inequalities, and suffering due to our own human imperfections. I am very thankful that Jesus taught us the two greatest commandments to guide us in times of doubt. It seems that Jesus was constantly getting into good trouble, and at the root of it usually seemed to be his daring to be kind, compassionate, and inclusive, even to people to whom others thought he shouldn't be. It's an odd thing about the human condition that we can get so upset at people for being kind to the, quote, wrong kind of other people. I wonder if that is why Jesus gave so much emphasis to the two greatest commandments, knowing how difficult that second one can be for us humans to live up to. I hope that if we collectively have enough courage to continually scrutinize what we believe and why, and its impact on others, that we will ultimately arrive to a better place, much closer to our actual potential, whatever that ultimately looks like. I also hope that that means we bring ourselves closer together and not further apart. Doesn't it seem like that is where the second commandment tries to lead us? The story goes like this. A preacher stands up in the pulpit for the sermon. After the reading of the gospel, Jesus' articulation of the greatest commandment in Matthew, which Ben read for us earlier. She takes a deep breath, places her hands on the edge of the lectern, leans forward and says, Love. And then she sits down. One of the deacons was heard saying on the way out of worship, that it was the best sermon that he had ever heard. I won't be quite that succinct today, but I will try to keep this brief. Doing so seems to be in keeping with the spirit of the text. Jesus is asked by the lawyer in our scripture which commandment in the law is the greatest. You may be aware that this kind of question was not unusual. In traditional Judaism, the Torah was under understood to contain 613 mitzvot, commandments, to which obedience was considered religious duty. These commandments consist of everything from the Big Ten to ceremonial laws for specific classes of people, such as a prohibition of the high priest having disheveled hair or torn clothes. Rabbinic discourse and commentary was and is no, and no small part in exercise in sifting through and prioritizing all of these commandments, discerning how to best follow the law for their time and in each circumstance, identifying what was most important, what was most essential, was a key step in that discernment. And as you can imagine, it was almost always a source of disagreement and contention, evoking lively discussion among different teachers and different factions. So regardless of what the motivation for the question put to Jesus in our scripture, and the apparent motivations of the questioner do differ depending on which gospel account you were reading, it is most assuredly not a surprise question for him. Thinking and dialoguing about such questions is pretty much what a rabbi does. In many ways, such debate, which commandment is the greatest, which is most important, how are we to prioritize one over the other, is exemplary of the essential work of ethical living. It's the kind of work to which Melody was referring in her reflection 
an image and word that she shared with us just before this homily. What do we really believe? And why? What is the core of our beliefs? And how do those beliefs guide our living? How do they inform our interactions with and our opinions of others? And how should we evaluate and scrutinize our beliefs over time to ensure that they are true to our ultimate values and that our lives are lived out in that truth? All of these questions are collapsed together into that master question that's put to Jesus. What is the greatest commandment? What is your core value, Jesus? What's the one thing to which all others boil down for you? What is at the center of everything that God commands, everything that you say you stand for? Jesus' reply is short, clear, and direct. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, and with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the greatest in the first commandment, and the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments hang all of the law and the prophets. Here Jesus quotes from the Shema, the primary confession of faith of the Israelites from Deuteronomy 6, 5. Love God. It's the perfect, unassailable answer. But he goes on to quote a verse additionally from Leviticus 19, 18. Love your neighbor as yourself. Jesus is unwilling to name just one of these, refusing to separate these two commandments. On them together, he insists, all of the law and the prophets hang. You can't have one without the other. If you love God, you must love your neighbor and yourself. As you love yourself and your neighbor, you live out your love for God. A preaching professor named David Luce says that in answering this question about the greatest commandment, our Lord names his center, the center of his ministry, the center of his mission, the center of the kingdom he has been sent to proclaim and build. And that center is love. It's not a detached, distant kind of love based on sentiment or feelings of affection. Rather, the primary component of the love to which Jesus speaks here is actually commitment. It means taking God seriously and also taking the needs and well-being of ourself and our neighbors seriously. It is a love that fuses theology and ethics into one consistent, cohesive center, a center that can be articulated in one single tweet-sized message. Now, I have to tell you, I'm not a big fan of Twitter. In fact, in an effort to maintain my sanity, I am presently a conscientious objector to this particular brand of social media. However, I do have to concede that when well used, Twitter does have the striking and unique benefit of forcing users to say their piece well. With its infamous char character limit, which now stands at 280 characters, including spaces and punctuation, it means that users have to cut out all of the fluff and get right to their point. There's no room for rambling on Twitter. So those who would use Twitter well have become proficient at identifying their main point and communicating it clearly and efficiency, efficiently. By my count, the entirety of Jesus' answer to the question put to him about which is the greatest commandment amounts to a grand total of 277 characters. And that does include proper spacing, punctuation, quotation marks to identify the two verses of Torah from the two separate biblical books that he quoted, and even the interpretive commentary he offered in conclusion. If Twitter were around in Jesus' day, these few brief lines surely would have been retweeted countless times. In those 277 characters, Jesus lays out the center of his life and his ministry and gives us a plumb line against which we can measure our faithfulness to this law of love, a lens through which we can continually scrutinize our beliefs, our actions, and our commitments, both for ourselves and our communities, and determine how close 
for how far away they are to the center. In 277 characters, Jesus gave us this gift, a center around which we can be drawn closer to one another and to God. Oh, that it might be so. Let us pray. God of truth and God of grace, as we seek to praise you, to love you, and to serve you, we find ourselves with many questions. Some of us are asking, who? Who shall I serve? Who will lead us? Who needs our help? Some of us are asking what? What is the point? What should I do with my life now? What on earth was I thinking? Some of us are asking where? Where is our world headed? Where will I be in 10 years? Where can I find someone to love me? Some of us are asking when. When will I find a new job? When will she die? When will things finally get back to normal? Some of us are asking why. Why can't I get pregnant? Why should I care? Why is there so much hate in this world? And some of us are asking, how? How can we make this work? How can we get through this? How can we make a difference in this world? 
even as we voice these questions, God, still others are there in the background, always there, but seldom asked. Are you really listening? Do you really care? Are you really there? And even in the silence that so often lingers, the answer comes to us. Ubi caritas et amor, Deus ibi est. Where there's charity and love, you are there. In that assurance, God, we take comfort. In that conviction, we find not answers, but a promise. In that declaration, we find a purpose for our living. May Jesus show us the way. Over the last several weeks, we have been asking folks to share reflections about our congregation, perhaps as a dialogue with God or simply as reflective sharing. We have asked them several questions to guide their thinking. What do you value and appreciate about the Bridgewater Church of the Brethren? If you had only one sentence to state what is most important for and about BWCOB, what would that sentence be? And for what do you long? for the future of our congregation. Today, we are blessed to have Ben Neer and Tashomi Malalenge offer their reflections on these questions with us. The song Homeward Bound was first recorded by Simon and Garfunkel on December 14, 1965. They released it as a single on January 19, 1966, and then on their third studio album, Parsley, Sage, Rosemary, and Thyme, a little less than a year later. It has since been covered countless times by countless artists, and it is regarded as a classic in the annals of music history. The story goes that Paul Simon wrote the song about the homesickness he felt while separated from his best friend Art and his girlfriend Kathy on a trip to explore the English folk scene. Whether we're on exploratory adventures or sheltering in place, I think we can all relate to the desire for homecoming. I don't pretend to know what makes something home, or as Edward Sharp and the Magnetic Zeros would suggest, what makes someone home. What I do know is that this community of faith is home for me. Despite being 1,500 miles away, tuning into church on the computer somehow makes me feel at home. I first attended the Bridgewater Church of the Brethren at the insistence of my grandmother, who would drive me to Sunday school every week until my parents began attending again several years later. My childhood is marked with memories of attending vacation Bible school, singing in the children's choir, and making apple butter. As I grew older, I joined the youth group and began to attend work camps and conferences during the summers, which allowed me to learn from perspectives other than my own breathing fresh air into my spiritual views. I was also afforded the opportunity to further explore my interest in the performing arts, 
through the Yorf Ensemble, the Puppet Ministry, and the Handball Choir. Now as a young adult, I have appreciated the opportunity to connect with this community over Zoom at a time when we're all longing for company. The through line in my faith experience is perhaps best represented by today's scripture from Matthew's Gospel. We will never agree on everything, but this community loves the Lord our God with all our hearts, souls, and minds. Furthermore, our love for our neighbors is evidenced by our work with local and international charities, our generosity with the use of our facilities, and the existence of our community garden. I recently watched the movie, The Two Popes, which tells the story of Pope Benedict XVI coming to the decision to resign the papacy, and Cardinal Bergoglio, now Pope Francis's decision not to resign from the clergy in 2012. A quote that has stuck with me since watching the film came from Pope Benedict, who reminds the viewer that we all suffer from spiritual pride. We all do. You must remember that you are not God. In God, we move and we live and we have our being. We live in God, but we are not of it. You're only human. As our congregation moves into its next chapter, it is my sincerest desire that we remember the two greatest commandments as well as these words from the Pope and allow them to guide our decision-making. This is a very difficult time to be alive, but I, for one, know where I can go, where my thoughts are escaping, where my music's playing, and where love lies waiting. Good morning. I hope all of you are well and staying safe. Pastor Christy and Chris have asked me to do the reflection this week, and I'll focus on two subject matters. First, what do I value and appreciate about the Bridgewater Church of the Brethren? And secondly, for what do I long for the future of our congregation? The first one is simple. But I have to tell you a short story. Professor William Albright, God bless his soul, introduced me to the Bridgewater Church of the Brethren. I was a freshman at Bridgewater College. This was back 1983, almost 37 years ago. I will never forget my first day experience at the church. They say, you only have one first chance to make one first impression that lasts a lifetime. I recall then many people lined up to say hello and introduce themselves. During my college years, I was very fortunate to get to know many members of the church, which most of them are no longer with us. It's an honor and a privilege for me to recognize Dr. Wayne Geisert, Dr. David Messler, and Dr. Neer. I am sure they're in heaven watching upon us. I am very grateful, so do many students from the college, for their compassion, generosity, and passion. What I value most about our church is its core values of equality, community, simplicity, service, and peace. These values are embedded, entrenched in my personal life, in my teaching, and also in my work. What I appreciate the most about our church is its congregation, you, the people. We have the most welcoming and kind people that I ever came across. When we bring our friends who are visiting from out of town, they always compliment the service and the friendly atmosphere. The children time, the fellowship host are a few of my favorite programs at the church. <clears throat> The second subject matter is very complex. 
while no one is really sure what is ahead. Talking about it at least allows us to position our church for the impact in a changing world. Our church story is deeply connected with the work of Jesus Christ. Jesus was a simple man. What Jesus had to say about how we should live our lives could be summarized in few phrases. Love others and give of yourself to them, especially the less fortunate, be nonviolent, be honest, be forgiven, be humble. Our church promotes the principles of peace and reconciliation. Simple living, family values, and service to neighbors near and far. Our people travel to Haiti and Nigeria, which are the most unfriendly countries that are around. They sacrifice their life, they sacrifice their time. In Matthew 22, verse 39, Jesus teaches us to love our neighbors like ourselves. Therefore, this is a message and the value we should carry further to assure the future of our church. In my opinion, it is very important that we engage in dialogue with our congregation continuously on this very principal issues that I mentioned earlier. To sum up, and this is from my heart, I can say that we are the most welcoming and engaged church that resonates the word of Christ. Amen.
You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your mind and with all your soul. This is the greatest and first commandment. And the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. What clearer directive could we have? May it be so.